<laughs> We're recording. <laughs> Good. So, and basically, this makes the point that really green public procurement, which means in our case, so taking into account environmental considerations in public procurement, can really help reduce the environmental footprint of the public sector, as well as, as supporting faster decarbonization of key industries, given that it has such a big impact on the private sector. I mean, 15% of GDP is a considerable amount of money and, and can really make a big difference. So our point really is that delivering best value for money for taxpayers is not choosing the cheapest option, but really make use of this money to deliver the best societal value. And that can be employment, environment. And then in our case, we're really looking at how green public procurement can support achieving our climate targets. So we focus a little bit, particularly on low carbon procurement and on these two sectors, so construction and road transport, where um, there's high emissions and where it can make a difference in terms of climate. So looking a little bit at construction, one of our two sectors, the public sector there accounts for 20 to 30% of the industry's revenue and with cement and steel uh, accounting for seven and 8% of global CO2 emissions, they're really important sectors to decarbonize to meet our climate targets and they're difficult to decarbonize. They require profound technological shifts um, to transform these industries and here clear market signals can really help de-risk the investments and create the demand that is needed to support this decarbonization. Um, but low carbon construction procurement is quite complicated because there is high level of embodied carbon in the construction materials, there's the operational emissions, so the energy use, uh, there's the differences between uh, construction and retrofitting, and there's also complex value chains involving a lot of actors. So if we look at, uh, there's already a few EU directives that are targeting this sector. Uh, the energy performance of building directives, uh, which requires public authorities to procure buildings with high energy efficiency performance. The energy efficiency directive that is a bit broader and applies to buildings, products and services, but it specifically mentions public procurement, uh, especially for public buildings and with energy efficiency requirements. And then finally, we have the construction product regulation, which is uh, set up to facilitate trade in the EU, but also suggest the use of environmental product declaration to, to know about the environmental impacts of construction products. So it's also important for, for public procurement. But what we see basically is that these uh, policies so far really focus on energy efficiency and that whole life carbon is missing. Um, but there is a current proposal for a recast of the energy performance building directive that, um, that will target more life cycle embodied emissions and aims to have net zero building by 2030. So we'll see how that evolves. Um, and turning to the road transport vehicles uh, sector. Uh, so this sector accounts for about 25% of EU's direct greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and currently the energy source is the largest climate impact of road transport vehicles. But as we start to switch fuels and electrify, the life cycle emissions will be more and more important. And the current EU directive here that targets the, the sector is the clean and energy efficient road transport vehicles directive, which requires public contractors to consider operational lifetime energy and environmental impacts when purchasing vehicles. There's also the battery directive, which harmonizes requirements on batteries and regulates certain substances. There's also a proposal here to, to improve this directive with more ambitious requirements, including life cycle emissions, circularity and labeling. But here again, we see that for this sector, the main focus remains on direct emissions and not embedded emissions. So to summarize a little bit where we are at, um, we see, high momentum around GPP, given the technological progress uh, that needs to be scaled up to meet the climate targets. But the implementation of GPP policies in the EU has been slow and fragmented, despite GPP being on the agenda at the EU level for over a decade, actually almost two decades now. Um, but the current implementation in member states is still much below uh, the indicative targets. And the new circular economy action plan from 2020 states that the commission will propose a minimum mandatory GPP criteria and targets in sectoral legislation and face in compulsory reporting. So we see that there's really some something happening. There's political leadership growing in the e, at the EU level, 
But at the same time, we see that there's a big gap and this needs to trickle down to the you know, national, regional and municipal levels to really encourage, encourage procurement officers in their day to day to set priorities towards low carbon tenders. Right, so this was a little bit the background and we'll turn now to, to our project overview, key findings and recommendations. Um, so today we're presenting the findings from our one year project funded by Breakthrough Energy. And our aim in this project was to unpack the existing barriers for green public procurement uptake at member state level, find opportunities to increase the implementation of green public procurement policies, and this basically in a long term effort to contribute to achieve greater policy coherence between decarbonization policies and green GPP related policies. And to do that, we performed eight case studies. So we looked at a set of member states, Sweden, the Netherlands, Estonia, Poland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And these basically we felt was a good mix of um, countries that are seen as front runners and some where the uptake is slower, but also larger and smaller economies uh, and countries with more centralized and decentralized uh, governance systems. Just quickly about the method. So we, we performed a desktop review with, of gray literature and policy documents. We reviewed all the existing tools and support systems, and we also performed a set of interviews with policymakers, procurement experts, and procurers. So turning now to, to our first set of results, we'll go through several themes. So the first one is governance. Um, so our key findings in terms of governance is that we see that often at the national level, there are several ministries that have ownership of the matter. Uh, often the Ministry of Economy or Finance responsible for procurement and the Ministry of Environment for the green side of it, let's say. Sometimes there's also, um, like in Sweden and Poland, a dedicated agency responsible for implementing policies. And in other cases, for example, in Germany, the implementation is divided and tasked between several authorities. So already there we see that the setup is quite different and with several layers at the national level. But we see that uh, in decentralized countries such as Germany and Spain, there's an additional fragmentation happening at the regional level where there is basically different regulations that apply to, to regional um, authorities. And this is important because subnational authorities account for 60% of public spending. So the regional and local differences directly impact the country's ability to meet the goals. Subnational authority is really important. And there, there's, this is one area where we really see that EU directives help facilitating the implementation of more harmonized rules across the EU, across these different uh, governance level. But looking a little bit at the EU, we saw that also several directorates, expert groups, advisory groups are working on this topic. So here again, we see this quite different governance set up in different countries, many entities involved at the national, subnational and EU level. And this creates quite a complex landscape to coordinate and to keep up to um, for procurement officers, because there's a lot of overlapping work and efforts to, to support the better implementation. So turning a little bit to our recommendation based on this, um, what we see is that basically we need to foster better collaboration and coordination to align environmental and economical targets with procurement policies and practices. And this needs to happen across national ministries and agencies with and within EU institutions and across member states. But we also want to highlight that we think it's important for some aspects that there is also better international collaboration uh, to harmonize approaches to, for example, on, on standards and data and so on. And this is important also so that we create an accelerated progress worldwide. Um, so this was about governance. Now we're turning to the, our next theme, which is goals, policies, and regulations. And here, our key findings are that most countries have national action plans in place to support the development of green public procurement. And these include overarching goals. For example, in France, there's a goal of 100% public procurement to include environmental criteria by 2025. And another example is Germany, which um, wants to become climate neutral, like federal administration climate neutral by 2030. But here you see that it only touches on the federal administration. So we're missing the subnational levels that we were just discussing just before. 
But the problem is we've seen that also often these previous targets have not been made, met. So for example, in France, the previous targets was 30%, but the actual achievement was 17%. So I mean, one thing is to set targets, another thing is to actually achieve the implementation. And that's what we saw also at EU level. Um, yes, and looking a little bit at whether uh, green product procurement is voluntary or mandatory, we see that in most of the member states that we have looked at, uh, green public procurement is voluntary beyond EU directives. Um, but for some countries like Italy and Estonia, in our case studies, GPP is mandatory for a selected number of product groups. Uh, looking at Italy, there's been a mandatory use of minimum environmental criteria since 2016 for priority groups, which include construction and road transport, so the ones we're looking at. But at the same time, we found a study that showed that the implementation rate of these criteria for public buildings was only 18%, despite being mandatory. Um, so again, a big gap between the goals, even with mandatory rules and the actual implementation. And this is due to a lack of um, penalty systems and follow-up mechanisms. In France, starting in 2026, there's a new uh, law that will come into place, and it is that at least one environmental criteria has to, is mandatory in all procurements, but for procurement, procur sorry, procuring authorities that procure for at least 50 million euros per year. Um, so, but this, it's interesting with this rule because it allows full freedom on the formulation and the impact of the criteria. So it could result actually in an unchanged outcome. You can design a criteria that doesn't really change, you know, who the final tender gets to, not who wins the final bid, sorry. So in generally, we also find a lack of follow-up and whether mandatory rules are applied and whether winning bids follow the requirements and score that contributed to winning the bids. Uh, as we, we already mentioned the example of Italy, where there's a lack of penalties and follow-up mechanisms. Another example is Sweden, where there's currently no follow-up uh, and penalty mechanisms for the application of the Clean Energy Vehicles Directive. So this was our summarized findings. And based on that, we have a, a few recommendations. So the, the first one is that we need to set product-specific carbon baseline values and targets and establish mandatory product level minimum carbon criteria, which is gradually sharpened. So we think here that it should be done in collaboration with trade association to ensure that the requirements follow and support decarbonization pathways so that we phase out products with low environmental performance, but also really give a push to, to scaling up new technologies. We also think we need to introduce voluntary award system for best performing offer. And this is really like to highlight, you know, highlight the best performance, not only cut off the, the bad performers. We think we need to expand EU directives to include embedded emissions and impose EU level minimum penitent thresholds if criteria are not met. Turning now to the monitoring systems. I'll take a sip of water. Mm. So here our key findings are that generally the data is lacking on the practices, impacts, and mitigation potential of green public procurement, which makes it difficult to argue for the best value for money of green public procurement, and also hard to follow up on progress made, which is also not, not a very good incentive to, to make progress. In most countries, we see that the national plans are regularly followed up on. Uh, but there's large differences in terms of systematic mo monitoring of, of the use of green criteria. And this is because it's not harmonized across countries and we get basically incomplete and incomparable results. One thing, for example, is that the definition for e the EU and member states are not the same. So again, it, it creates this like there is some monitoring, but it's done in very different ways. In Estonia, for instance, we found that the monitoring system caught less green public procurement than actually performed. Um, but and we also found that France was a good examples there was a good example there where they, they have a dedicated observatory for public purchases, which annually compiles data and makes it publicly available. In terms of impact monitoring, so so you know not just monitoring whether the there was a green criteria or the number of procurements, but actually the impact of this uh, changed process of having green criteria. That is still nascent. So in the Netherlands, we saw the Netherlands was one of the only countries from our case studies that attempted to monitor procurement impact in terms of saved greenhouse gas emissions. 
but we also found some good examples um, at subnational level in, in uh, Berlin and Catalonia, efforts to do so. So this leads me to our recommendations in terms of monitoring systems. Here we see that we think we need at EU level developing harmonized systems for def definitions, methodologies and reporting and monitoring to support following up on the use of environmental criteria considerations in procurement and assessing the environment, environmental impact of procured products, sorry. Um, we also need to set mandatory annual reporting on environmental impacts and uh, uptake on member states' public procurements. Finally, we need to de develop tools to allow procuring entities to monitor being public, public procurement uptake and its impact at the organizational level to support aligning internal goals and create better in incentives at the, at the you know, really implementation level, the organization level, and that would also help reporting efforts. Great, and so our final category uh, is the largest one, uh, implementation and uptake. So you will see we've divided up here in a few more slides. So if we start with implementation, we see that there's a lot of tools and support mechanisms that have been developed. Uh, member states and the EU provide training, capacity building and a help desk. desk. This is everywhere. Um, and in some countries, as well as the EU, uh, there's criteria databases that have been developed for green public procurement, as well as life cycle costing or LCA based tools. And here a very famous example is the Netherlands, where multiple tools have been developed specifically for low carbon procurement. Um, one called the CO2 performance ladder, for instance, to help evaluate uh, tenders. Uh, a couple of countries, and as well as the EU, have also developed collaboration platforms for procurers and or public-private sectoral groups, so to create more interaction between the public and private sector. So, but despite all these efforts to create, you know, better support for implementation, we see that many barriers remain, and the most common ones are the lack of knowledge, capacity, and peer-to-peer -peer learning at the procurement officer level the lack of resources to spend time on procuring in new ways. And this includes also learning about and using the tools provided. So basically, even if there's many tools that are being developed, the procurement officers themselves need to learn about them, understand how to use them, and that requires time. We also see, for example, that uh, annual budgets at organizational level can create split incentives. Another uh, classic barrier is the lack of standardized data and reporting systems to easily compare and evaluate product impacts. We already kind of touched upon that. Another important one is the lack of public-private dialogue to learn about market offerings, offerings and ways to procure in creative ways. So basically, it all starts with understanding, like making market research and understand what can be like what is the innovative or new way uh, of procuring. But again, this also requires time. And finally, the, the last one is the lack of mandate and the fear of litigation or disputes. So basically creating like um, procuring in an innovative way may, may result in getting less uh, or the worry of getting less uh, bids or uh, creating a dispute because it's a very legal matter. So overall, we see that the good practices that we see, they usually rely on very informed and motivated individual, but for individuals, but for the majority, there's these barriers still standing in the way. So looking a little bit at the, at the uptake, uh, here we see that basically there's big differences between countries, like we already mentioned. And here the numbers that we have is that it ranges from 1% in Poland to 67% in the Netherlands. But as we said previously, um, these numbers are quite it's, are hard to compare and um, potentially incomplete because of the problematic uh, monitoring systems. And member states experience difficulties in systematically using green public procurement in an impactful way. We see this gap between the targets and the actual implementations. However, in some countries, regions and cities, there are already ambitious and innovative practices um, for example, Catalonia, Berlin, and Rob, and we'll hear a bit about that uh, in the panel discussion. So still a lot, of, a lot of examples to be excited about. So now comes a little longer list of recommendations to try to improve the implementation and uptake. The first ones in terms of implementation, 
are to further develop, harmonize, and promote the available tools and support material to ensure accessibility to procurers. This includes, for example, having them translated, the ones produced at the EU level. And we also need to develop standardized, reliable, product-specific methods to calculate and report environmental data. We need to develop harmonized training programs, including components that support assessing the innovation potential as well as the procurement needs. And we also need to simplify the terminology and provide uh, implementation guidelines for procurement directives to reduce this fear of litigation. And our next set of uh, recommendations are on more mandates and resources. So we, we need to ensure that procurement officers have clearer mandates and adequate financial resources to play a strategic role in implementing green public procurement practices. And we need to develop educational material demonstrating the green, green public procurement societal and monetary value to build stronger political buy-in. We basically have a hard time showing that it's the best value for money because of this lack of data. And finally, in terms of collaboration, we think we need to deepen public-private collaboration through, and there's some examples already of sectoral bios groups, so we, we think we need to keep um, developing those, uh, as well as finding new uh, ways of collaboration between procurement officers so they can learn together from each other. So to conclude um, this long presentation, uh, we see that public procurement is currently really an underused policy instrument that's really powerful and can drive uh, low carbon innovation. There's an untapped potential to, to turn it into a, a strategic policy tool. And for that, a GPP policies need to be better aligned with industry transition pathways. Procurers need to be given a clear mandate and capacity to play a strategic role in implementing these visions. And here we really think that the EU can play an important role in supporting the implementation and impactful practices through standardized reporting methods, tools, mandatory requirements. So, and we want to say again that there are many innovative examples already out there um, that are a great source for inspiration. But what we think is really important here is that we, we need to get the, the scale and consistency to really have this impact on the markets that is required for accelerated decarbonization. So with that, <laughs> I will take back some breath uh, and uh, hand over to Evelyn for the panel discussion. Thanks a lot. And don't hesitate to share some questions in the Q&A. If you have some, I, I can try to answer them in the chat. Yeah, they are, <clears throat> they are already. <laughs> Great. <laughs> You can uh, you can check them, uh, but I yeah I will uh, take over here. Uh, we have uh, prepared uh, also some panel discussion. I'm happy to um, introduce here our our panelists uh, today. We have uh, here Nancy uh, Gillis, who is program head uh, at Climate Action and First Movers Coalition in World Economic Forum. Uh, welcome, Nancy. We also have here uh, Anna Esteve Traveset, uh, Environmental Qualification Service Technician uh, at Directorate General uh, for Environmental Quality and Climate Change Ministry of uh, Climate Action uh, in Government of Catalonia. And uh, also Ronya Pichot, Policy Analyst at Internal Institute for Sustainable Development. Welcome all, all panelists and, and um, we have prepared uh, some questions uh, for the panelists, but you are also welcome to post them in uh, Q&A uh, in the chat uh, and we'll, we'll take them as, um, as we can, we'll see how many there are, we might uh, combine them a little bit. Uh, and also, yeah, if you have some questions related to study, then also put them in chat and, and we try to answer them during the during the panel discussion or, or take them if needed also later. Um, so, uh, Ronja, <laughs> you and your team at ISD have been working on, on similar research. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, where were you, uh, what were your key findings and, and how do you, um, or how do they relate to what Astrid just uh, presented? Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, yes, we've done research about a specific GPP tool, the CO2 performance ladder. The CO2 performance ladder is an instrument for low carbon procurement. 
and for carbon management for companies. And it has a long track record of being used in GPP in the Netherlands and in Belgium. So now we research the potential of using this specific tools also in other European countries. And we're about to publish our feasibility study about the potential of the CO2 performance letter. Um, and while Astrid was presenting um, the findings, I really thought a lot of our findings overlap. So we also really see this growing momentum for GPP. It's high on the agenda of many countries um, and many procuring authorities. And many really want to consider carbon emissions in their procurements, which is driving a demand for new tools. A lot of tools are out there already, um, but procuring authorities are still really using for which tools to use and how. And still monitoring GPP remains one of the main challenges that we heard about. Um, GPP output is increasingly monitored. So we know a little bit more now about the number of tenders with green criteria, but we still have a long way to go when it comes to actually monitoring the um, impact, the outcomes of GPP. How many tons of carbon emissions are really reduced to GPP? So that is really the question that many people ask themselves now. And this also needs that we need more practical tools. We heard about the capacity constraints that uh, many procurers face. They don't have the time or they don't have the knowledge to really integrate sustainability into their tenders in a meaningful way. So they really need practical tools that help them to raise their ambition level. But that also means that they need training, both the procurers and the suppliers. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ronja. Uh, Anna. You work directly with uh, procurement at the government of Catalonia. Uh, how do these findings relate to your experiences uh, of the daily hurdles of trying to implement GTP? I, uh, the experience of, of the government of Catalonia fits very well with the results of the study. In Catalonia, uh, GPP is voluntary. Uh, but there is an action plan with an objective of achieve 50% uh, of GPP in 2025. Uh, currently, nowadays, we are uh, we have 41% of uh, GPP in Catalonia. Uh, we have since uh, 2016 a follow-up uh, system, a monitoring system to uh, have this data, uh, and we. Um, uh, every year we try to um, um, have a better data because uh, first of all the procurers when introduce the the um, the procurement the procurements in the in the public register uh, they have to check if is a if, if include or not environmental clauses and we've now are, we do a, a effort to check if this data is correct or not uh, for every uh, ministry and, and public agency. I think that it's important to, to check the, the data provided by the procurers, because if not, it would be a little bit tricky. And another result that I very agree with the study is that it's very important the cooperation between ministries. Uh, here in Catalonia, the responsibilities of uh, GPP are uh, shared between the Ministry of um, um, Climate Action, Food and Rural Agen Agency that I belong to, and the Ministry of Economic and Finance. And uh, we cooperate for years, and it's very. It's I think that it's the key of the successful of the GPP in Catalonia because, uh, for instance, we develop guidelines for procurers, uh, for some uh, product groups, and all these guidelines are um, approved at the end for the admi administrative contract advisory board. This uh, give a lot of uh, legal uh, security to procurers, and they use these guides um, broadly. And uh, we also cooperate to monitor uh, the data of GPP and to develop indicators for GPP. And, and we also green all the uh, centralized contracts and framework agreements of the Ministry of Economics and Finance. And, and it, it makes that the, the data of GPP are very higher now. 
And on the other hand, I think that it's important also the cooperation between different uh, public administrations. For that, we, for instance, we are member of Procura Plus to know the best practices around Europe. And for us, it's very useful because we can share experience with another countries. And a lot of times we, we learn uh, experiences that we can in, introduce in our tenders. And for us, it's very useful because it's difficult to know the market. And the, the market now nowadays is international. And if I close, uh, it's good for Italy, I don't know, or Sweden. It's also, it, it, we can also introduce this clause. We know the results, the, the, the problems that we, have, we can have uh, with the bidding. And for us, it's very useful. And we also have a um, network of Catalan public administrations, local and regional, because we want to harmonize a little bit the, the, the green uh, clauses that we include in tenders to give a, a, a clear signal, signal to the market and also to share experiences. And it's very useful also for us. And well, these are the, the most important uh, results that fits with our reality. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we now turn to Nancy. Uh, you have a long experience of, of working with GPP, both uh, at the Obama administration as well as Global Electronics Council, which provided training for uh, procurement uh, offices, officers. Um, what are your reflections when hearing about our findings? Yeah, so thank you very much for including me. Um, I am in an interesting position because as was mentioned, I have a long history of working in uh, GPP, so uh, public procurement as a way towards addressing sustainability or reducing climate impacts. But that was of course in my time at being a representative of the US government and working in public procurement there, or as the CEO of the Global Electronics Council that actually runs one of the leading eco-labels for IT equipment. But now I'm on the side of leveraging private sector procurement, um, being here at the World Economic Forum as part of the First Movers Coalition. So it's interesting as we have had this conversation to see where there are changes over the last 20 years of my career in what's been being driven by public procurement and now what is the role of public procurement, even harnessing and leveraging what private sector procurement is doing. So first, I would just say that I agree with all of the findings um, that, that were shared and also want to um, highlight the importance of collaboration amongst uh, industry, uh, excuse me, amongst agencies, particularly also the collaboration necessary now between public sector and private sector where it's relevant, cement and concrete, an area that uh, the First Movers Coalition focuses on, very relevant. Um, even some of the additional long range transportation sectors where governments actually uh, do procure um, in trucking and aviation and shipping. Uh, again, what, what I see is really important is the collaboration between what they're what is being asked for for uh, within public procurements and what is potentially uh, now being asked for in private sector as well. And then um, I think what is a really big important aspect of what needs to still happen is definitions. So we talk about, Narania talked about pragmatic tools. It's not only the tools, because there are many of them, it's really the, what are you asking for? What is a credible definition of a net zero product or, or supplier? Um, and so this is, or service even. So I think really one of the big emphasis that I continue to see is how do we define it so that when we are monitoring that it's being bought appropriately, uh, that we know, um, and then the last, I would say, in the interest of time as well, and forgive me for my camera, it has now turned into a very sunny day to where I am, which is nice, but not for an on-camera on uh, discussion. But um, it's not only the standards and you know, making sure we actually know 
and what uh, what we're buying that it's credibly um, uh, more sustainable or in my case, uh, true uh, near or zero uh, carbon uh, products and services. I think the last is then also this question of that Ronnie brought up impact. We used to now monitor for, um, do we have the contract clauses? Have we actually included in procurements? Increasingly, and this is where I see the shift in now private sector taking lead. It's not, have I put it in there? It's, so what? What is the actual impact? Um, and absent our ability to not only monitor and say, okay, this has been included, the, the terms have been met, but to quantify that into an impact I think that's going to be one of the big challenges that's coming at us much faster than we're actually prepared to address. So that would be my feedback from the findings. But I thought the, the research and the findings themselves, wonderful. And I can't help but say, having been in the field of procurement as a way to actually address and increase sustainability and address the climate emergency that we're in, it is so exciting to see this recognized as such a powerful way, especially uh, from a policy mechanism that I hope many, many more countries will now implement and really leverage. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for this valuable mm -hmm. uh, feedback. Um, now, going back to uh, Anna, uh, what do you think is the most important action for the EU to take uh, to make GPP easier to implement for you at the government of uh, Catalonia? Uh, for us, it's very important um, to know the reality of the market. And we make a lot of efforts to do uh, to cooperate with the private sector, uh, doing prior pre market consultations, dialogue, the, uh, market dialogues, and but um, and um, sometimes it's not easy to, to have uh, data and to know exactly uh, the reality of, of the market. No? Uh, for that, I think that the, the guidelines of the European Commission about GPP are very useful for procurers around Europe, uh, but there are uh, not, but they cover. Uh, a few products and services, 14, I think, currently. And uh, I think that it's important to, to make this that the, the European Commission or in a, in a European level, uh, an, organist, uh, an, an organist could do this, this effort to, to have uh, some um, minimum cr criteria or a standard of environmental criteria that uh, could uh, work, that uh, the market is prepared to, and that it's uh, aligned with the environmental European policies. Uh, I think that it's it's really, really important for us. And on the other hand, I think it's also important uh, to have uh, easy tools or methodologies uh, to assess the environmental impact of GPP. Uh, currently, we can we, we have this data. We know the percentage uh, of economic value and the percentage of number of contract um, procurements that include environmental clauses. But we need to say to the politicians and to the so society uh, which is the advantages of doing that. Because if not, um, I think it's difficult that GPP. Uh, uh, being a, um, a strategic tool for environmental policies. We need uh, methodologies that are um, the, the maximum uh, harmonized around Europe, easy to easy, free and uh, for, for, for bidders and also for procurers to, to check this data and to communicate the, 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 the benefits of GPP. We only made a uh, um, um, pilot uh, project uh, to evaluate the CO2 emission savings of some tenders related with vehicles and IT products. It was very interesting, but covers only the use phase. It's 
a, a specific uh, um, part of, of the environmental impact of the products. And I think that it's necessary to, de to develop these tools for me. It's the, it's the most important to, to communicate and, and to, to pos position GPP as a strategic tool for environmental policies. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, now a question uh, to Ronya from uh, from chat. Um, to what extent can the CO2 ladder work uh, in other countries? Um, or maybe you can also mention which countries you have yes. thought? Yes, of course. Uh, it's a very good question, a question I thought about for the last one and a half years. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, we researched 10 European countries um, in detail, um, like Germany, Austria, Sweden, Denmark, the UK, Ireland, uh, Spain, Italy, Poland, and Slovenia. I think now I captured all. Um, and we do see a big potential for the CO2 performance ladder. I mean, it has 13 years of track record in the Netherlands. So we know that this aligned with the um, procurement directive and it is legally safe to use and a lot of material is available. We, we do see a need, of course, for training procurers and also informing the market that this tool is coming because the companies need to get certified on the CO2 performance ladder or they can get certified. And that, of course, um, needs preparation. But we see the great potential there because the CO2 performance ladder is third party verified. So it's not the task of the procurers to check whether the companies really meet the requirements that they put in the tender, but the third party does that. And this is really a way to overcome these capacity constraints that we heard so much about, like really relying on third party proof makes this process of ambitious GPP a lot easier. And in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that, but I will also share a link to some of our materials and our feasibility study is coming up in the next weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now um, we turn to Nancy. Um, you are currently head of uh, First Midwest Coalition, uh, a group of companies trying to implement similar principles, but within the private sector. Would you say that the EU is lagging behind in terms of implementing policies and securing markets for, for green products? Um, I always love making myself popular and I hope that uh, most people have uh, gone to get another cup of coffee because yes, I do believe that the, uh, the EU is lagging behind because what uh, building on, on what Rania just shared um, and then it has as well, it's the fragmentation, it's waiting for GPP to actually get down to implementable levels. Um, and it's the uh, inability to actually leverage some of the tools that are out there that I have found um, both in public sector time that I had and now increasingly in, in private sector, which is the use of standards and more importantly, eco-labels. As Rani pointed out, something where what it is, is defined clearly, is publicly available, a company can decide to meet it, and then a third party validates that it has been met, and that what the procurer just needs to know is this, is this an acceptable, in that it has been third party validated, and does it cover the category that I'm buying in and give me enough access to the products and services my, my country, my city, my company, my organization and my program needs, right? It really does reduce the reliance on training, capacity building that we find is still a big inhibitor to engaging in sustainable procurement, public or private sector. So I think what the United States is doing right now as an example to what the EU isn't, is at the federal level, creating a single list of standards and eco-labels, third-party validated, and pushing all of their spend against those in all of the categories that they buy. Um, I think it just simplifies it and it really helps private sector supply base because then you have a lot of money going against a very clearly defined group of products and services that are being considered credibly sustainable or 
addressing um, from the carbon perspective. So even looking at embodied carbon. And I think that really is a leadership position and is something that's not what I'm seeing uh, in the EU at this time. Thank you, Nancy. So it's clear that we have to keep up. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's good that we have also um, um, hope that we, our findings and our work also um, are contributing to uh, to that. But I now uh, thank you all the panelists. It was uh, it was really uh, good having you here and and, and addressing um, our findings and and answering and giving your feedback and and experiences to to us. Um, I now give over to, or back to Astrid for the closing words. Thank you. Exactly. So I won't take more of your time. Just wanted to share that um, there's already some material out there uh, that you can find on our website. Uh, three briefs describing and comparing the, so Sweden and the Netherlands, Estonia and Poland, Germany and France. And here we chose them to see a little bit similarities and differences for countries that are seemingly similar. So. Um, Sweden and the Netherlands, for example, seen as front runners in, in uh, Europe, but are actually quite different. And the project report with all eight case studies and, and more on the EU legislation will come out anytime soon. So we'll uh, share that with you as soon as we have it uh, with recording of this uh, session and um, with the slides. And there will also be a policy brief covering the key insights and recommendations that you heard today. Um, so thank you again for participating, um, and I'm sharing here the context of my colleagues, um, which will be, because I will actually be moving on from SEI, so please reach out to Katrina Evelyn or Eileen um, for future work. And big thank you. And yeah, goodbye, everyone. <laughs> thank you.